trying to do uh, is to look at three important infectious uh, conditions. Now uh, you look at infective endocarditis, we look at uh, skin and so severe skin and soft tissue infections and nosocomial infections. So we will look at each one of them in a little bit of detail. Um, we'll start with infective endocarditis. So um, Infective endocarditis, as we all know, is uh, infection of the endothelium of the heart. It is an important infectious condition uh, across the cardiology spectrum. The incidence is reducing uh, across the world because of the... Okay. So the annual incidence of uh, infective endocarditis is about 3 to 10 per lakh of population. But it also depends upon what spectrum of critical care you are seeing. If you are a high-end center looking at a lot of cardiovascular patients who have valve replacements and other processes, this incidence might be a little higher. The mortality of infective endocarditis is up to 30% at 30 days. So it's an important condition for us to understand. Why is this important from a critical care perspective? Because the epidemiology of infective endocarditis is changing and there is an increasing incidence of nosocomial endocarditis. As I mentioned, if you are doing a lot of valves and prosthetic devices, your incidence will be higher. Staphylococcus aureus is the most prevalent cause of infective endocarditis in most studies across the country, uh, world, even in India, at 26.6% of all the cases. This is followed by the viridans group of streptococci, which have an incidence of about a uh, contribution of about 18.7%, and other streptococci about 17.5%. Enterococci are uh, uh, also now increasingly being isolated from samples of endocarditis, and their incidence is 10.5%. But if you are looking at oncology patients, the incidence of enterococcal endocarditis is a little higher. What are the predisposing factors for infective endocarditis? Infective endocarditis can have either cardiac predisposing factors or non-cardiac predisposing factors. The cardiac conditions are the bicuspid aortic valve, which is an innocuous condition but can be complicated by endocarditis, mitral valve prolapse, rheumatic valve disease, the incidence of which is decreasing, congenital heart disease, prior infective endocarditis, prosthetic valves and implanted cardiac devices. Whereas the non-cardiac causes which are predisposing to endocarditis are chronic kidney disease and liver disease, intravenous use of drugs of abuse, advanced age, malignancy, marantic endocarditis is what it's called, corticosteroid use where fungal endocarditis is very common, poorly controlled diabetes mellitus again where fungal endocarditis is more common, immunocompromised state like retroviral disease and other immunocompromised states and indwelling lines like long-standing chemoports and vascular access catheters for dialysis. What are the clinical features of endocarditis? The, the over, over and overwhelming feature of endocarditis is uh, fever. So the classical teaching was a patient with a fever and a new murmur with splenomegaly is a patient who should always be investigated exhaustively for the absence of endocarditis. You cannot exclude endocarditis if these three if you, uh, you have to exclude endocarditis if these three constellation of features are always present. So the commonest feature is fever followed by a new murmur. If there has been an old murmur, like an aortic regurg or a mantle regurgitation murmur, if the gradient or the intensity of the murmur has changed, then the worsening of an old murmur is also a clinical feature of new endocarditis. Vascular embolic events, as we shall see in subsequent slides, is the other manifestation which is often seen in patients with endocarditis. Splenomegaly, splinter hemorrhages, and other uh, and other peripheral embolic sequelae like Osler nodes, ANV lesions, and hot spots are also part of the clinical features of infective endocarditis. What are the complications? Why are you so bothered about infective endocarditis and its complications? Embolization is the most common cause of um, uh, complication of endocarditis of which stroke is the most common, and non-stroke embolization to peripheral vessels, kidney, spleen, and other organs also happens in one-third of the patients with infective endocarditis. As aortic valve endocarditis and new uh, and a new MI mitral valve endocarditis can trigger heart failure. So heart failure can ha happen in 50 to 33 percent of patients with infective endocarditis. About one-fifth of the patients will have an intracardiac abscess which manifests with pericardial effusions and conduction abnormalities. 
and new conduction abnormalities as the sole manifestation happen in less than 10% of patients with infective endocarditis. So these are the peripheral uh, embolic sequelae of infective endocarditis. First one is the Osler nodes, which are the painful erythematous nodules on the tips of the fingers and the toes. Janeway lesions, which are non-painful erythematous macules on the palms of the hands and soles of the feet. And retinal hemorrhages uh, called rod spots with pale centers. So fundoscopy is an important part of uh, working up of a patient with infective endocarditis. Similarly, uh, new uh, nodular opacities in the lung with a halo sign is suggestive of pulmonary emboli or uh, sequelae, and splenic infarcts are also known in patients with infective endocarditis. The most well-known, well-accepted, well-validated diagnostic criteria is the modified Duke's criteria for infective endocarditis. This modified Duke's criteria categorizes endocarditis as definitive and possible or in unlikely endocarditis. For definitive infective endocarditis, you have a pathological criteria, pathological criteria, and clinical criteria. The pathologic criteria are microorganisms demonstrated by culture or histological examination of a vegetation or a vegetation that has embolized into the lung or spleen or kidney or the specimen from an intracardiac abscess. Or you could actually look at pathological lesions or intracardiac abscesses or vegetations confirmed by histological examination showing active endocarditis. This is one of the pathological criteria. This has to be combined with a clinical criteria where two major criteria or one major criterion and two minor criteria or a, a total of five minor criteria are required for you to establish uh, definitively a diagnosis of infective endocarditis. When only one major and one minor criteria are present or only three minor criteria are present, it is a possible infective endocarditis. Alternative diagnosis has also to be entertained. If there is a firm alternative diagnosis explaining the evidence of in infective endocarditis or the resolution of infective endocarditis syndrome with antibiotic therapy for less than few days, four or less, less than four days, or there is no pathological evidence of endocarditis in the histopathology specimen, or it does not meet the criteria which we have discussed above, then the diagnosis of infective endocarditis is unlikely and is rejected. What are the major criteria we spoke about? The major criteria is a typical micro, a blood culture positive for infective endocarditis is a major criteria. So the blood culture can show typical microorganisms consistent with infective endocarditis from two, two separate blood cultures like viridans streptococci, streptococci bore, streptococcus bovis or the hatchet group of organisms or staph aureus or a community acquired enterococci in the presence or absence of a primary focus. Or you could also have microorganisms consistent with infective endocarditis from persistently positive blood cultures like at least two positive blood cultures of blood samples drawn more than 12 hours apart or all of three or a majority of four or more separate cultures of blood uh, with the first and the last sample drawn more than one hour apart and single positive blood culture for certain organisms like Coxiella burnetti or uh, uh, some of the uh, some some of these organisms which cannot be normally explained in a blood culture if they are grown you should entertain a diagnosis of endocarditis the other major criteria is evidence of endocardial involvement, like an echocardiographic evidence of infective endocarditis, like an oscillating intracardiac mass on a valve or supporting structure in the path of regurgitant jets or on the implanted material in the, in the absence of an alternative anatomical explanation or abscess or new partial dehiscence of a prosthetic of a new prosthetic valve. So partial dehiscence is a indication that there could be an infective process going on uh, around the valve where, where you have uh, where, sutured the valve. New valvular regurgitation or worsening or changing of a pre-existing murmur is not sufficient. There has to be a new valvular regurgitation for you to be called as a major criteria of endocarditis. What are the minor criteria? Predisposition, predisposing heart condition or the use of intravenous drugs. Fever, which is important, which we saw is one of the cardinal symptoms of uh, endocarditis. Vascular phenomena, which we have discussed. Immunological phenomena like glomerulonephritis, ocular nodes, thought spots and rheumatoid factors. And microbiological evidence like positive blood culture, which does not meet the major criteria which we have discussed or serological evidence of active infection with organism 
consistent with infective endocarditis on molecular diagnostics what are the causes of culture negative endocarditis it is not a true culture negative it it, it just means that the patients have an infection or an endocarditis which is occur with a difficult to treat organism or it is the total the cause of endocarditis is totally non infective so the organisms which can cause endocarditis but cannot be isolated on first uh, look blood cultures are bartonella coxella burnetti and trophorema vipulae and some fungi like aspergillus there are also conditions like merantic endocarditis libman sachs endocarditis associated with sle and trauma trauma related endocarditis which are non infective where you can get a culture negative uh, reports while there is endocarditis which may not truly call as infective endocarditis what are the other investigations which need which can support your diagnosis and help you in the treatment of these patients at trans thoracic echo is a cornerstone it is an essential tool for uh, assessing patient with endocarditis so a bacteremia with a regurgitant heart murmur a recurrent fever with regurgitant heart murmur a recurrent fever with possible cardioembolic events or a quantitation of severity of valve dysfunction are all indications or uses of endocarditis for trans esophageal echo you need to do a trans esophageal echo if there is an abnormal trans thoracic echo suggestive of endocarditis or there has been bacteremia with prior prosthetic valve replacement valve repair or implantable uh, electrical device if the trans thoracic echo is normal but there is a high clinical suspicion of endocarditis you need to exclude it by a trans esophageal echo and it is also used for the evaluation of possible structural complications of infective endocarditis like aortic root abscess the fdg pet ct is now the new modality which is be used in quite a good number of patients with endocarditis especially if they have suspected prosthetic device infection like a valve or a graft or an implantable electrical device with a non diagnostic trans esophageal echo or there are extra cardiac complications like an abscess in these such situations a pet ct is probably a, an indication or is needed for evaluation of patients with infective endocarditis